Secret Status Edition is an event that the YSS have been running for quite a few years now. Uh, the goal really is to kind of show early career statisticians and data scientists what's available in terms of uh, career path, but also in terms of what kind of topic areas you could you could work in uh, once you once you leave education. And and so we, it's always been a popular event over the years. And this year. Uh, mostly so that we could get some diversity in speakers. I actually asked Liam, uh, who's the chair of Merseyside, if we could sort of pull our resources together and come up with a, a speaker list that kind of bridged both both groups. So um, without further ado, uh, we'll go into the to the speakers. The speakers will speak for like maybe 10 to 15 minutes each on their individual career journeys. And then at the end, because the event is an hour and a half, we'll do sort of a 20 to 30 minute panel so if you have any questions pop them in the chat as we go along but also we we can have questions at that section too uh, so our first speaker is Catherine from National Museums Liverpool uh, Catherine do you want to share your slides and then we can get going hi I'm Catherine and I'm the preventive conservator at National Museums Liverpool and um, so this is just a quick overview here of the topics that I'll cover today and hopefully highlight where data and statistics play an important role in my job. So I did, sorry, um, my undergraduate degree in history at the University of Kent and here my dissertation focused on the role of museums and memorialisation of World War One. And while in my second and third years, I volunteered at, with the curatorial team at Dover Castle, learning about caring for our collections there and the de their documentation. After graduating, I did an assistant merchandiser internship at George um, at ASDA. And I gained lots of skills here, although I realised that this kind of office environment wasn't really for me. And I left after four months to pursue something a bit more closely related to my degree. Um, and then I worked at front of house in visitor operations at Ashby de la Zouche Castle, which is here pictured on the left. Um, this was a, in a really small group. Uh, there's a team of three of us, so I undertook many different roles here. Um, including things like cash handling and stock rotation, this type of thing. And then from 2012 to 2018, I was a collections care assistant uh, for English heritage in the South East and North London regions. And this really increased my knowledge of caring for a really wide variety of collections in many different historic spaces. Um, and on the right here, you can see this is cleaning and front of the public um, whilst open at Kenwood House in North London. In September 2018, I moved to Cardiff to undertake my MSc conservation practice, and this was more focused on objects or bench conservation, and this was to diversify my skills. Um, due to the pandemic, my dissertation changed from being lab-based to one based on the environmental data from past students' work at the SS Great Britain, which is a ship in Bristol. And then May 2021, I moved north to National Museums Liverpool in the Project Conservation and Decant Officer role, um, while a large heating system project was undertaken um, at the same time that we also had a very tight exhibition schedule and a lot of conservation treatment that needed to happen. So this involved really communicating a lot of environmental data um, to non-specialists, as well as working out the risks to the collections from that data. And then from January 2022 to current day, I've been the preventive conservator at National Museums Liverpool. So what is preventive conservation? It's defined by the International Council of Museums as all measures and, and actions aimed at avoiding and minimising future deterioration or loss. And it's sometimes also referred to as collections care. Like many organisations at National Museums Liverpool, we use the 10 Agents of Deterioration Framework to categorise risks to collections, and that's pictured here around the urn. And these are physical forces, dissociation, incorrect temperature and relative humidity, light and UV, pollutants, pests, water, fire and crime. Some of these are really immediate and catastrophic, like fire, and others are more cumulative, more like pollutants. At National Museums Liverpool, everyone here plays a part in caring for our 
for our collections, but to differing degrees. Um, sorry. Um, formed in 1986, NML is a group of museums and galleries across Merseyside with collections of around 4 million objects on display in public venues and in store. Um, preventive conservation sits in the collections care department, which you can see on the far left here of the diagram. And we work to embed the preventive conservation strategy with colleagues through advice and training. Um, a typical day for me starts with checking emails and then environment the environmental monitoring software, which I'll talk a bit more about later. I normally check the charts are up to date and possibly have to reset the software. And then I'll scan two or three sites um, for any anomalies to their data over that last week um, and action anything urgent. There are three technicians in my team, so I always catch up with them on the day to day work as well as future plans and their professional development. Um, I also attend meetings and these can be a mixture of exhibitions planning and monitoring or core collections care work with colleagues from my department as well as external stakeholders. And then we also do core collections care work, which can be advising colleagues, writing procedures or working on site delivering training. As the preventive conservator, one of my main responsibilities is for the environmental monitoring system. It's made up of LTEC sensors as the hardware in the galleries, storerooms and conservation studios, as well as the darker heritage software. And we use about 350 sensors that predominantly monitor temperature and humidity. You can see these are depicted on the left hand side of the diagram. Um, on the slide and they transmit data every five minutes to the data logger on site, which is also known as the squirrel. And this in turn transmits that data the, to the network server. We use this data for monitoring conditions for NML collections and for reporting back on loans from other organisations. Um, our current challenges here have included making choices about upgrading that server as our current one is not going to be supported and then to help support this work, we have a team of environmental venue reps at each site and they undertake those weekly checks and some of the on-site tasks as well. Um, as I said, some of the challenges here have also been that we've got quite highish staff turnover and therefore training has been interesting to kind of um, adapt to the hybrid working environment as well. Um, as well as the hardware and software, there are like transmitter sheets with documentation document wait a second the location on and so verifying the different elements of this system and auditing them has been one of my bigger challenges as well over the past 12 months um so far that's included just moving everything into one workbook so we can trace the different sensors between sites um and clean up some of the the data there and see actually what we have so another platform of data that we collect is our environmental monitoring of light. So we have less of these sensors and they are detecting light and ultraviolet and they help provide cumulative data on the exposure levels and duration of this to our objects, especially those that we class as highly sensitive. And we can use this data to inform our conversations and decisions about duration of display and also to keep an eye on whether control measures are working. For example, we don't need ultraviolet light to see, but it's incredibly damaging to many objects and therefore we can cut this out using shutters or film on windows but that does need replacing. Alongside the cumulative data, we also take spot checks, which you can see Isabella taking here on the right hand side. And this normally happens before we open an exhibition, for instance. Um, as well as the visual checks of the charts, we this software, the LTEC software and DACA is used to create the statistics reports, which are used to report on our key performance indicators annually to the Board of Trustees and help us track progress. The first one that was developed was for relative humidity and is scored as a percentage of time that the space is given is within the given parameters. For many of our spaces, this is 40 to 60 percent RH, and our aim is to improve all these scores with, to, with 80 percent of the time and parameters deemed acceptable. Um, we also look at the data quality coming through from those transmitters, and if there's a low 
number of transmissions, then we reduce the score to 25% and we look at solutions to improve this as well. On the right hand side of the slide uh, is the top sheet of the action plan that we use in our annual preventive conservation surgeries. And this shows the KPI scores for the site. At these meetings, we take time to discuss these KPIs with internal stakeholders, such as estates or the curators, and collaborate on solutions to improve the environmental performance of the spaces. These surgeries help us look across the venues and identify risks and then prioritise our actions and use of resources. We also have developed other KPIs, including one on light and then one on pests. OK, so these images are a little bit on the abstract side, but they record three incidents that have been reported by colleagues on the sites in the past year. For instance, from left to right, we have a painting with a really dusty surface and finger marks, mud on a textile that came from somebody standing on an object, and then a break in the foot of an object. The online smart form allow, records that information into an Excel spreadsheet, which is easily searched and it helps us map risks to our collections and prioritising it allows us to prioritise our time. We can use this information in the surgeries, as mentioned before, or if my head of department quickly needs some information, um, for instance, on water ingress incidents that have been um, a frequent occurrence this year. So another area where we use quite a lot of data is integrated pest management. And this is a core part of my role and thinking holistically about preventing and monitoring as well as control methods to reduce the risk of pest infestation to our collections types. So this involves working with a quite a range of internal stakeholders, so curators, entomologists. Pest species are those that are deemed a threat to materials that we hold in our collections. And on the slide here, you can see a, a furniture beetle, also known as woodworm, which was found during a painting treatment in the studio. We've got a woolly bear larvae, Arisa vespuli, which is here, and then some cases from case bearing clothes moths. So accurate recording of these numbers of insects in the monitors um, is really important for building up a picture of the background numbers of insects, and that helps us also deem when we might have an infestation um, as well. So similar to the environmental reps, I have colleagues that every quarter take time to inspect, swap out monitors and record the insects found onto a spreadsheet. And as I've noted on the slide, this presents challenges when we've got high staff turnover, as both training people to be confident identifying and recording takes quite a lot of time. Um, Dr. Christian Bars, who is our Head of Collections Care here at NML, and Professor Jane Henderson from Cardiff University have been working on a different format to the sheet shown here, and that uses something that's called the Pest Occurrence Index, and this accounts for the area of the space that the monitors are in, which helps avoid the skew that occurs if you add further monitors or take them away from a room. So that's kind of newer kind of thinking on that. And then some of the other roles that um, sit within our department that we might have and use statistics are people like conservation and heritage scientists and also registrars who are heavily involved in the documentation of an object's life within the museum or gallery. And they also ensure that the records are collect correct for our objects and liaise with other organisations to do with loans and um, both inward and outward. So thank you for listening and um, I look forward to your questions. Oh, great, thank you, Catherine. Uh, next up, we have John from Mersey Rivers. Thanks everybody. So good afternoon, I'm John Sanders. I work for a charity called the Mersey Rivers Trust. So it's gonna spend a little while just explaining some of the importance of statistics in the work we do in terms of river environmental management. So just a little bit about Mersey Rivers Trust. So as I said, we're a registered charity and we work to improve the river health of, of the all the rivers that make up the River Mersey system. You can see on the map here uh, to improve that for people and wildlife. Uh, we've got 15 members of staff, but we've also got around about 180 volunteers who come out and help us on a regular basis to carry out improvement works and river cleanups. And we've got quite a large population in, in the Mersey catchment that we look after. Um, so about 5 million people across the whole of Cheshire, Merseyside and Greater Manchester. And there's about 27 key rivers that make up the River Mersey system. 
So as well as the River Mersey itself, we've got a lot of other rivers that flow into the Mersey estuary, like the River Weaver, the River Alt, which you may be aware of in sort of Liverpool and Cheshire areas, and in Manchester, place, rivers like the River Irwell and the River Bolin uh, and the River Oak. So we've got a large area to look after, and as you might imagine, we've got quite a lot of data that we need to uh, to look at, analyse, uh, and turn that data into information and evidence. So a little bit about myself. Um, so I started off doing a geography uh, BSc degree. Um, interestingly, statistics was quite a key part of that degree. Um, we were forced, I'm going to say forced, because I, I can't say I'm a, an enthusiastic statistical uh, Practitioner, uh, but I certainly understand and value the importance of statistics, as we'll see later. Um, but I'm so not very good at doing it uh, in practice. Um, so I feel a bit of an interloper today. Uh, but uh, yes, we were forced to uh, take uh, compulsory modules in statistics. Uh, and I've got real, really no excuse for saying my statistics is bad because uh, the person that uh, did a while lecturing is now the UK National Statistician, uh, Professor Ian Diamond. So uh, I've got no real excuses. Uh, but I did learn a lot from doing that statistics uh, modules as part of the degree, and it served me well throughout the rest of my career. Uh, so although I was reluct a reluctant participant, uh, it has been very useful uh, in my career to date. Uh, then moved on to do an MSc in Environmental Technology at Imperial College, um, which probably had less statistics involved in that course than the, uh, the undergraduate course. But nonetheless, statistics were, were a key part of that, of that course. Uh, and then I spent the last 30 years really applying my degrees uh, with a career in both water and, and river management. So I worked for the Environment Agency initially uh, in East Anglia, uh, and then moved north up to uh, Greater Manchester and uh, Merseyside, uh, working for the water company United Utilities for around 20 years. Uh, and then more latterly, I, I moved into environmental consultancy, uh, principally still working with water companies and the Environment Agency, but on a consultancy basis. Uh, and then moved to my current role at the uh, Rivers Trust uh, in 2019, which I have to say is probably the best career move I've ever made uh, in terms of the enjoyment factor um, and being able to get out and about a lot more than certainly in my previous uh, roles uh, until for very recently I was mainly office based. So it's been good to be able to get out and about and do things in the field as well as uh, in the office. As I already mentioned, statistics are really essential to river and water environmental management. Uh, we have very large data sets that we need to look after and manage, but we need to turn that data into robust evidence that we can use uh, to determine what actions we need to take to improve the health of our rivers uh, and to influence others to do the right thing uh, to improve river health. So, for example, you've probably seen on the news quite a lot of information around sewer overflow data. Uh, there's around about 4,000 sewer overflows just in the Mersey alone, um, each with 15-minute data that we have to analyse uh, and understand how those uh, overflows are performing, uh, which ones are causing problems for the rivers, uh, which ones are less important, less urgent to tackle, which are the priorities to, to address uh, in the short term. And that data isn't just spatial, it's also temporal. Um, so we've got both, both factors to look at. We're looking at long-term trends, understanding what's happening uh, to the river environment. Uh, so, for example, analysing data to understand how different land uses affect water quality. So uh, does an urban catchment have uh, a greater impact on water quality than a rural agricultural catchment, for example? And obviously, we're also looking at very long term trends and projections looking forwards uh, to try and future proof uh, environmental protection uh, for our rivers. Particularly, uh, as you'll be, I'm sure most of you will be aware, of the potential impact of climate change on future river flows, on water quality, on sea levels, and the like. So, data and statistics really plays a key part of everything that we do, um, and we really do need to turn that data into evidence, uh, so that we can then prioritise actions uh, and influence and uh, encourage others also to play their part. So. We are involved in quite a lot of monitoring gathering in the field. You can see some pictures here of some of our colleagues uh, who go out on a regular basis collecting data in the field, um, be that water quality information, river flows, river levels, the biology of the rivers. And we also then need to gather that data and collate it. Uh, we've got a number of uh, GIS-based databases that we collate all our data. 
uh, to help us both manage the data initially and then obviously to do the subsequent data analysis. And it's not just us doing this work. Uh, back to the volunteers I mentioned earlier, we've got an army of uh, citizen science volunteers who very kindly give up their time um, to help us collect that data and carry out what we call citizen science monitoring and data gathering. Uh, so we provide training to volunteers to go out uh, and take take readings and measurements on our behalf uh, to upload those uh, to our data systems. Uh, and then we will do the analysis, but also it's very important that we present back to our volunteers uh, what we're finding, what their data is telling us uh, to encourage them to continue collecting that data for us. So if anyone is interested in being a volunteer for us, uh, please do get in contact and we'd be very happy to uh, try and find uh, some monitoring for you to carry out for us on our behalf. So I just thought just bring uh, the use of statistics a bit more to life uh, using an example of one of our projects that we've got uh, underway currently in the uh, Liverpool area. And that's our Plastic Free Mersey program. Uh, so this is a uh, collaborative project with a range of partners, um, including industries that uh, manufacture plastics, uh, industries that deal with the waste from plastics. Um, we're also working with Liverpool City Region. We're working with the, the mayor of uh, Liverpool City Region, Steve Rotherham, who you can see in the picture on the top left, uh, who came out and did some litter picking with us uh, last year, uh, with Merseyside Waste and Recycling Authority uh, and with local authorities like Liverpool City Council. And again, this is a volunteer uh, based project. You can see some of our citizen science volunteers in the bottom there, uh, who we've trained to carry out surveys of plastic pollution along all the rivers that make up the River Mersey, as you saw from that map earlier. And as you can see on the picture on the right hand side, unfortunately, plastic litter in the Mersey catchment is a major problem. Although water quality generally is improving in the River Mersey uh, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, the, the amount of plastic that's in our rivers, unfortunately, is increasing. Um, but until we started this project, we had no real way of gauging uh, what the scale of that uh, problem was, the spatial uh, resolution of that, of that impact, um, and whether things were getting better or worse. Uh, and we really wanted to collect some real hard evidence and data uh, using uh, citizen science volunteers to go out and do regular monthly surveys uh, to understand what's going on. So you can see here the survey method is around taking a section of river. Uh, it's a 60 meter squared section and we do two sections per site uh, for volunteers to go out and they register all the different types of plastic that they can find uh, using an app on the, the Survey123 app, uh, which is freely available uh, to, to download a survey app. And that all the data they collect uh, automatically goes into our uh, ArcGIS database system. Uh, a mapping system so that we can automatically uh, upload the data so it can be readily uh, analysed. We've currently got around 20 different sites, as you can see on the map in the top left, uh, where volunteers go out on once a month uh, to take to, to undertake the surveys, uh, categorise all the litter they find, both plastic and non-plastic, so we can understand the relative difference between the amount of plastic versus paper, metal, glass, uh, fabrics and other things that might be found in the river that shouldn't be there. So we trained about 33 volunteers, citizen scientists to date, uh, around about 204 surveys completed so far over 20 sites. Uh, you see there we've categorised nearly 7,000 items of litter uh, over the last 12 months. So that's quite a bit of data already for us to look at and analyse. So I will very much say this is not my work uh, moving forward. These next few slides is kindly being done by our colleague Hannah Smith, our Sister Charity Thames 21, who's helped us do all the statistical data analysis of the data we've collected. So many thanks to Hannah for, for doing all this. Um, so we've, we've done some simple analysis to start with to understand what's the, the general makeup of the litter we're finding, uh, what's the average, what's the mean. You can see this, the 95% confidence limits shown on this data. But certainly plastic food packaging, sanitary items, uh, which includes things like wet wipes uh, and cigarette butts, interestingly, uh, come top of the top of the pile in terms of the, the litter items that we find. But we've also done some more, what I would, to my mind, is more complex statistics. Um, and hopefully some of you will, will be far more familiar with these tests uh, than myself uh, to try and understand a bit more and, and drill into the data in more detail. So we've tried to look at the number of litter items to see if it, if, is, it is it consistent across all sites. 
Uh, and statistically, there is a, there is a difference uh, between the amount of litter we're finding at different sites, as you can see in the chart on the left. Um, and we've also used the uh, post hoc done test uh, to understand uh, which litter items uh, are being found more regularly at different sites using a pairwise comparison approach. So we're just trying to understand whether different rivers have got different types of litter being being found or as well as the total volume of litter being found. We've also looked at whether there's more litter on sites where bins are present or not present. Um, and again, the, the, the statistics we've carried out have indicated there is a statistically significant difference. Um, perhaps not surprisingly that uh, there's more litter at sites where there's no bins nearby uh, than those where there are bins uh, located near to the site. And we've looked at um, whether different types of litter uh, are more likely to be found, whether there's bins available or not as well, as you can see uh, below. Although the statistical tests we've done so far uh, has suggested that uh, difference is, uh, is not material. And we've also looked to see whether um, the amount of litter relates to where fly tipping has been uh, identified by our volunteers. But again, uh, that's one of the areas that has, has indicated there's more litter statistically where fly tipping is uh, has been carried out nearby. It's not unsurprisingly again. Uh, we've also looked at the relationship between littering and rainfall and river levels. Um, and perhaps more surprising, we found there is no strong correlation or relationship between uh, rainfall over the last 20, 48 hours or river levels uh, and the amount of litter we find, which is was surprising to us because we know that rivers act as a conveyor belt of litter. So once litter gets into a river, it can move very quickly from, say, Manchester to Liverpool in a couple of days. Uh, and some of the litter we find in Liverpool uh, has definitely not been dropped in Liverpool. It's probably been dropped in Manchester or Warrington or somewhere else upstream because uh, the rivers are a very con effective conveyor of litter. So why is it important? Um, it's great to do with statistics, understand what's going on, but actually what do we need to do with this evidence that we're gathering? Uh, and a very good example of this is we've been working uh, with Thames 21 charity and other rivers trusts uh, with, a local, with an MP called Fleur Anderson, uh, you can see here on the, on the slide. And she has been the key MP who's promoting a ban on the use of plastic in wet wipes uh, moving forward, which has nearly got to a point now where the government is about to uh, bring that into law. There's a con consultation currently uh, taking place with the public uh, to confirm uh, that approach. But that's been based on the evidence that we found from our volunteers and volunteers on the River Thames going out, collecting that data and evidence, analysing it robustly with, with good, uh, robust statistics, bringing that to members of parliament, uh, getting a par parliamentarian to promote a bill, uh, to work with the government through through the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, uh, and ultimately getting the government to back the bill uh, and enshrine it in legislation. So these things are important, but the importance of robust statistics uh, cannot be underemphasized. Uh, it's really important we have that evidence. Lawmakers will not make decisions on introducing new legislation uh, without some really strong, robust evidence to back it up. Uh, so it's been very valuable in having the statistical information as well as obviously the data in the first place uh, from our volunteers. So as well as talking to parliamentarians, we also want to make sure we disseminate information around uh, all of our work uh, to the public. And so to some extent, we have to then uh, come back to a more simplified version of, of all the statistical analysis that we carry out uh, and present information in a way that's that's meaningful uh, to the majority of the pop population who perhaps do not have a, a strong statistical background or knowledge. Um, so we use things like these dashboards on our uh, website uh, to try and convey that information in a, in a very relatively simple but uh, hopefully a uh, direct way uh, to members of the public. And we also uh, try and communicate via the media both social media and TV and, and radio. And I guess just one thing for, for perhaps uh, those of you who have not started your careers yet, uh, there will come a time, I suspect, in your career where you'll need to convey information that may be fairly complex statistically, but you've only got two minutes on a radio radio show with no visual aids. So it can be quite a challenge to, to uh, convey what I've just been talking about over the last 15 minutes uh, into a two-minute snapshot uh, with no visual aids to back it up. Uh, so that is something to... Uh, 
definitely uh, think about some of the, for those of you who may be interested in being a communicator of statistics, as well as a practitioner of, of doing the calculations. So finally, I uh, say a big thanks to Hannah Smith at Thames 21 uh, for carrying out all the statistics you've seen in this presentation, uh, and equally importantly to our citizen science volunteers who have been out in all weathers over the last 12 months collecting the data. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, next up, we have Lucy from BT. Hi there. Um, just going to share my screen. I hope that's visible. Yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Rishdi. Um, OK. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Lucy Gullen and I am uh, an AI and modelling research specialist at BT. Um, if you haven't heard of BT, then uh, it just stands for British Telecom and we're the biggest uh, telecommunications provider in the UK. Um, and basically enabling you to do things like, you know, stream TV shows in your home, providing broadband, um, make phone calls, you know, use your mobile, etc. So um, we're all about communications and connecting people, basically. Um, let me start off by telling you a little bit about how I got to this position in my career, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my day-to-day -day, uh, working life. So um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is uh, yeah, starting out. So I had an interest in statistics from quite a, a young age. Um, during my A-levels, I took A-level statistics, and I was really lucky because I had this amazing statistics teacher. Um, I feel like we learned statistics through osmosis almost. Um, we Basically, he spoke to us about all different things, hardly any other thing about statistics. And I felt like we all came out with some kind of weird knowledge of statistics from that because he was very example driven. So, for example, during that class, we like wrote to Smarties. We did some hypothesis tests on whether the blue Smartie was underrepresented in the pack and things like that. So we did a lot of really fun activities um, and really active um, kind of learning to get us to get to grips with the basics of statistics and the building blocks that were there. Um, so I already thought statistics were pretty cool before I went on to do a maths degree. Um, and one of the things that stuck with me from that kind of education, that early education, was uh, and he, that he drilled into us, that was how statistics is powerful. So it can be used uh, for re really well um, or it can actually be misused. And, and um, it's really important to be questioning uh, like the types of statistics that you see in the media and on online every day, even more importantly, recently, um, and where they're coming from. So I have a cat with me today. She's probably going to jump up a few times. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that's it. I started out. I really enjoyed statistics, and then when I went to um, at university at Lancaster University, I studied mathematics, um, and I took um, a lot of modules to do with statistics because of that. And I also did a research internship uh, during my second year uh, that basically helped me to decide, do I want to do research, um, i.e. do I want to do a PhD um, and, and continue my studies, or do I want to kind of go straight into the world of work? And the research internship really showed me um, that independent uh, work was possible. I hadn't thought of it uh, prior to that. I thought that it would be really difficult to go off and study a, a subject and really get to the nitty gritty of things and try and progress it. Uh, that would be really hard beforehand, but quickly found out that research is actually just really small progressions uh, over time. There's very rarely a light bulb moment where you completely you turn um, a whole topic um, from, from nowhere. So um, it felt possible because of that research internship. And I did that at um, a place called Story, which is where Shrishti did her PhD as well, um, which is basically a centre where they um, interface statistics with operational research techniques um, and um, which are basically like mathematical problem solving techniques like optimization and simulation um, and uh, you kind of do PhDs based on that there. So, so once I'd finished my degree, it felt natural to go back to the place I'd done my research internship and do a PhD there. Um, and I was really, really lucky um, to get a, a PhD project that sat right on the interface of statistics and OR or operational research. Uh, so I was basically looking at um, how to quantify uncertainty in simulation. So simulation is a, a tool, um, an operational research tool used to kind of simulate um, um, a system that you're interested in. Maybe it's a factory, maybe it's a, um, an A&E department or something like that. 
and you use that to do what if analysis so what if I add another bed to my a &E department what will that do to my waiting times and things like that so that's kind of I was looking at how can I quantify error or uncertainty in that type of a tool so that it makes it a better tool and you've got a better understanding of what can go wrong when you're making decisions using it. Um, and I was paired with Northwestern University during that time. So I flew out to Northwestern a few times and I flew to international conferences. And um, I'm going to make it sound magical, but I'm sure a lot of you are doing PhDs in here and know how hard work it is as well. Um, but they were just the, the plus points of, uh, of doing that. Um, so overall, an incredible experience, even though it was really hard. Um, yes, and then I'm a glutton for punishment. So actually, when I finished my PhD, I saw a job come up in Lancaster University Management School in simulation and stochastic modelling as a lecturer um, slash researcher. And I decided I was going to apply for it because it couldn't hurt to apply for um, a job that I'd been kind of doing research in already. And I got that job. So I started off in an academic career, which is quite different to the career I'm doing at the moment. Um, and I, I loved all different aspects of it. So I was teaching, I was doing research. There's quite a lot of admin. Um, but yes, uh, after a few years, I realised I was doing a lot of theoretical and methodological work, but I wasn't actually connected with the kind of people that were using simulation as a tool. So um, I wanted to go out and actually learn about how simulation works in the real world, how complex it can be for actually representing real world systems. Um, so because I thought that might have a, an influence on maybe my research di direction in future. So after a couple of years in academia, I applied for a job at BT and um, I got that. And now I'm a research specialist there um, and I work on all sorts of different operational research and statistical problems. Um, and I get to use my statistical background slash simulation background quite a lot, which is really useful to me and hopefully them. Um, but I also learn new things all the time and uh, telecommunications is so complex that um, often we have to come up with quite new research ideas and we're always kind of pushing forward research. And so it really is a nice place to work because I get a lot of free reign in terms of uh, research time as well as um, almost like consultancy based projects, um, which um, I'll talk about kind of now. So. Um, yeah, working at BT, I kind of split my time uh, on a day to day basis between long and short term projects. So we have um, we're I'm in a area of BT called Applied Research and we interact with lots of different units of BT that are customer facing. So um, that might be security units or it might be like the, the people that actually run the BT network or it might be open reach or th things like that. So we speak to all of them and they come to us with problems and we try and help them with our analytical skills to overcome the kind of problems that they might see. So, for example, um, modelling household bandwidth usage has been um, kind of a, an ongoing um, on off short term project um, where we created a, a large model of um, how people actually interact with devices in their home and how that consumes uh, bandwidth. Um, and therefore, we can ask questions about that. So I'm going to go into that a tiny bit more detail next. But on to, in terms of like longer term projects and more research based projects, we've also been looking at things like um, self learning algorithms um, to try and create autonomous systems that can can run themselves basically. So that's where multi arm bandits, which if you haven't heard of it before, um, they're a kind of a tool that's used to make um, decisions over time where you have a you kind of see a repeated decision that comes in over and over again. So that might be um, I have a customer that's just come into my website. What kind of um, advert do I show them or what kind of uh, screen do I show them um, the first? Or it might be um, somebody's just called up BT because they've got a fault on their line. Uh, what action should I take next? Should I send an engineer immediately or should I try and turn the line off and on again? That kind of. Um, decision based problem that you would repeatedly see because by repeatedly seeing it you've got time to learn what the optimal decision is over time so so that's a longer term project um, that we've been looking at and we're working with different customer facing units to try and implement at BT okay but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, modeling household bandwidth usage um, not too much because I know we're tight on time so um, 
basically, if you think about the devices that you use in your home, um, they all do or don't use bandwidth. So watching television, streaming services does use bandwidth um, and all sorts of different activities, maybe your your gaming and things like that as well. Um, we can model or build a model of you going about those activities um, through through the week and put that all together into a, a model of how different households look um, and also combine that with information on what types of products people have, what types of line they have going into their home. And all of that comes together within this bandwidth model, which is just um, a type of simulation model called an agent based model. And that's because it's driven by um, from the bottom up from small agents, i.e. devices, up to people, up to households, and we generate total bandwidth consumption for a number of households in, in that way. Um, and we build this model um, by looking at inputs like, you know, your socioeconomic makeup of households, um, what we know about people's line types going into households, and then things also like um, how often we expect you to be watching television and when or what times a day we expect you to be watching television, etc. Um, and all of that data externally comes into us, into our model, and then we validate it by looking at, oh, does that match the viewing patterns or the bandwidth consumption patterns we actually see across the core network? So once we have this validated model, um, we can use that to ask all sorts of different questions. For example, if we can make um, future forecasts of how we believe people will consume their bandwidth in future, we can try and see if our network as it stands will withhold the pressure of what's coming in the future. Um, it can also help us with like marketing and product development. So we don't want to actually uh, market a product that would actually put a lot of stress upon our network should everyone choose to purchase it in the future. Um, and also, um, one of the key things we've been doing recently is actually considering network energy consumption. So could we um, kind of adaptively turn our cabinets, which control um, how much bandwidth the households receive um, up and down um, and therefore save energy across our network? Because BT uses a lot of energy. I think it's something like 0.7% of the UK energy um, in total. So if we can start to save energy at, you know, house, um, not household level, but um, across our network in different areas, then that would actually have a huge impact on the um, energy consumption of the company. Yeah, so it's those types of what if questions that we would try and answer with this type of simulation model. Um, yeah, I think that was everything I was going to say. Just a little glimpse into the uses of uh, uh, simulation and the stuff I do at BT. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Next up, we have Mehdi from the Civil Service Fast Room. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Mehdi. I uh, work at the Civil Service and I'm currently on the Civil Service Fast Stream. Um, so I'm not going to go in, uh, in my presentation, I'm not going to go into too much depth about um, individual projects and things, but more show kind of a variety of things you can end up doing or what we do in the civil service. So I'll cover a bit about um, um, the civil service fast stream in particular, but also the the various posts I've had in the civil service so far. So uh, I completed my master's in physics with theoretical physics from the University of Nottingham in 2015. I then started a astronomy PhD at the University of Nottingham, but unfortunately I uh, uh, became quite unwell and so I had to leave that program and so I wanted to pursue a career which combined lots of um, kind of opportunities to do a variety of different technical things and interesting um, kind of um, analytical bits of work but also gave me the flexibility of um, plenty of flexibility given my health concerns so I, I joined the civil service and specifically the, the fast stream which is a graduate scheme um, to try and accelerate people to uh, a, kind of, uh, a senior level within the civil service. So I've done four posts so far and I'm in my uh, currently in my final post. 
So about uh, analysis in government. So there's quite a lot of analysts in government. Um, there's about 17,000, most of which are um, members of the um, government statistical service. That doesn't necessarily mean they're trained statisticians, but it means that they work with statistics regularly. And there's also other uh, professions within um, the government analysis function, so economists, social researchers, and operational researchers. And, but there is quite a lot of overlap within their um, their duties. And so um, as I'll give examples in the, uh, shortly, there are things you can end up doing as a statistician, which are quite similar to what operational researchers and social researchers and economists do. So on to the fast stream. So the fast stream is a four year uh, as a as a stats, the stats aspect of the fast stream is four years long. Um, uh, you do three government stats posts and then you in the third year, uh, you either do a secondment or complementary posting. In my case, I did a complementary posting as a policy official in Department of Health. And like I mentioned, the idea is to end it, uh, to enter a, a relatively moderate um, grade and then finish ready at a, a quite senior grade. So you're ready to kind of lead a team. And throughout it, you're meant to be developing all, all your key statistical skills. So that's acquiring data, data analysis and communicating an analysis to both a technical audience and a non-technical audience, uh, but also your general uh, kind of career behaviours, so how to communicate with uh, colleagues, how to work with a team, working at pace, making big decisions with a short amount of time, things like that. And then the, the main thing being uh, leadership. So my first role was a, as a migration and benefits statistician in the Department for Work and Pensions. And so that was mostly working on two uh, publications, one which is relate, uh, using national insurance registrations as a proxy for migration and as a look uh, for the, um, uh, as an estimate as, of the migrant working population in the UK. And the other was uh, benefit, uh, looking at benefit recipients um, by nationality. And so in, in, in terms of kind of statistical skills, that was focused mostly on communicating statistics to the public in a really clear, concise way, where at the same time making sure they understood the granularity of that all that information, and in particular that rich data set we had of people's nationalities, but also the numbers of people you're dealing with, millions of people. And through that, I developed a, you know different programming skills, which I never had previously, and work with organisations like the OSR, so that's the Office for Statistics Regulation, to try and make sure that those publications met all government requirements as set out in the what's called the Aqua Book, so that's government guidance on statistics, and making sure they ticked all the um, all the best uh, they were they ticked all the best practice guidance, and uh, in fact, actually, one of them was eventually um, badged as a national statistics publication. So that means it's considered one of the best statistical publications produced by uh, the UK government. I then worked as a, a environmental statistician in uh, Scottish government, uh, which was a very different, which had some similarities. So there was, again, an aspect of producing statistics to communicate stats to the public. So that was related to um, uh, the Scottish government environmental strategy, uh, as well as waste disposal statistics in Scotland. So looking at that, looking at trends in terms of waste produced by different local authorities in Scotland and things like that. Uh, but then I did some uh, Quite interesting work which was very different from what I did previously so that was things relating to uh, Scottish government's targets towards peatland restoration for the purposes of absorbing carbon from the atmosphere and that involved building lots of models to try and predict um, to check how feasible those targets are and try and find the best um, the optimal re route to restore peatland to meet those targets within the costing and time um, the time constraints. I worked with local regional uh, uh, with regional uh, local regional land use partnerships, so that's uh, bodies of local authorities which are focusing on um, optimizing the use of local land to help Scottish government reach its environmental targets. So that's uh, kind of biodiversity targets, but also carbon sequestration. And that work that involved learning lots of new skills, learning R. Um, learning uh, how to do geospatial data analysis that through GIS and then lots of uh, working with the local authorities directly. Uh, and then uh, one of the big things uh, I did within Scottish Government and something I'm really proud of is um, starting uh, a, the integrated digital data program they have up there. So that's uh, co combining data across all of Scotland, so not just within Scottish Government, but local authorities, charities, arms length bodies, research bodies, 
uh, universities and putting all that information together. And that's a multi-year project I was involved. Well, I was only involved at the setup, uh, but that's a multi-year project still ongoing. Uh, so within that, my role in Scottish government, there was a lot of different statistical techniques I had to learn, lots of data analysis, building, uh, understanding uh, data quality, combining data sets together, um, doing things I've never done, to, such as like just working with geospatial data and stuff like that. But then those skills I already had, which was uh, communicating, uh, going back to one of the big roles in government, which is communicating stats to the public and informing decision making uh, by uh, senior officials and ministers. And then my current role is working as a, a assistant trade statistician in the Department for Business and Trade. So again, there's, uh, uh, well, this seems to be a common theme, uh, producing stats. Uh, in this case, it's producing stats for UK trade and investment. So that's one of the key um, outputs of the Department for Business and Trade. Um, so if you go on the government website. Uh, and one of the big things I did in that was uh, moving it from a, a manually produced uh, publication to something produced via reproducible analytical pipeline. So in that case, um, the commentary within that uh, that publication changes depending on uh, the variables going in. So it doesn't require someone to manually type out the trends and stuff like that. It goes through, does the, um, after the analysis is done, the commentary automatically updates. And so it requires minimum input from a person and from a, from a quality assurance point of view, it means there's a lot fewer mistakes. Uh, within this role, also, I've had a lot more uh, 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 hands-on experience, as it were, talking to ministers and senior statisticians. So there was lots of writing briefings. So in that case, slightly less technical work, but it was taking technical analysis or um, taking uh, data, simplifying it and being able to communicate to ministers and therefore influencing decision making at the, you know, at the top of government. Uh, one of the big roles I've had uh, also this year uh, in this post was uh, relating to um, um, working with junior statisticians as well. So being at the closer end, at the end of the fast stream, mentoring and working with junior statisticians, and that involved kind of upskilling uh, junior statisticians through giving lots of seminars and things like that, but also let me stretch some of my own statistical skills by doing uh, survey work. Um, so building sas uh, satisfaction surveys and then using that to influence um, how uh, how statistics is done, or at least statistics is trained, uh, how junior statisticians are trained in different departments and how they, their um, learning and development evolves with time. So that involved uh, kind of learning how to build surveys from scratch, working really closely with social researchers and learning about that, learning best practice and stuff like that, which was really interesting. And then um, doing you know, traditional statistical techniques to seeing, uh, to, to analyze the responses. So, um, you know, your typical t-tests and over things like that. Um, the other really nice thing about working within the civil service is that there's a huge opportunity to learn a lot of different things, even if it's not directly related to your to your day to day work. So in my case, I've done a lot of work recently learning about gravity models and Bayesian statistics and machine learning, things which don't directly impact my the roles I've had so far and my current role, but it will allow me to, to work. Uh, well, hopefully in the future, as uh, different as I move across my career, uh, allow me to to use the skills I've developed here and uh, implement them there. So uh, there's a brief overview of all the variety of different statistical things and, and uh, my career uh, so far in the uh, civil service. Uh, so, so thanks very much. And uh, yeah, I look forward to everyone's questions uh, at the end. Thank you for that. Uh, the last speaker that we have is Ian from the University of Liverpool. Hello, everybody. Yes, yeah, so just to introduce myself first, I'm, I'm a professor of analytics at the University of Liverpool. Um, and as an academic, um, it's a it's interesting to hear your thoughts earlier that you didn't feel like you were connected to the real world. Um, I think it's my responsibility to connect myself with the real world. So I engage in consultancy quite a lot with various organisations and companies. Um, and I find it a very fruitful experience being able to teach, being able to do research and being able to connect with the real world. Um, right, so... Oh, a little bit of 
history about how I ended up where I am now. So I did an undergraduate degree at the University of Liverpool in mathematical physics. Then I did a PhD in extreme value statistics at the University of Manchester. Um, and then I began to get jobs. I went out into the real world in between my undergraduate and postgraduate degrees and worked for the Ministry of Defence for six months and realised I didn't like that. Um, I then did my PhD. Then after my PhD, I worked as an investment analyst for six months and realised I didn't like that. Um, and at that point, I realised I did like learning and I did like research. Um, and that it, if it was possible, I'd want to do that for indefinitely. Um, and I think that's what academia enables you to be able to do. So I applied for a job at the University of Salford and I ended up there for nine years as a lecturer, senior lecturer and reader in statistics. Then I moved to the University of Manchester for a year and then I had a, an offer to go back to Salford to work with a former footballer called Gary Neville. So they were setting up a sports analytics research group of which by that time I was very much involved in. So I got an offer to go back to Salford so I ended up going there for two years and then um, the University of Liverpool Management School, it's got a centre for sports business. And I was effectively poached and brought home to Liverpool. And I've, I've been in Liverpool ever since. So what's my research path look like? So as I say, my PhD was in extreme value statistics. So this is where you try and predict the occurrence of extremely rare events. So I was applying this in extremely rare weather events so floods and lightning strikes um, but it's also used in finance because it's extreme events in finance that cause the um, market to crash or or boom so that, they're the things that where people make or lose a lot of money so extreme value statistics it's got lots of applications and i thought that was going to be what i was going to do for my career um, then when i started at salford by pure luck one of the secretaries um, at the university had a new boyfriend and she emailed the statistics department and said, my new boyfriend works at the Premier League and he's interested in speaking to people who could help him rate players. And I quickly put my hand up and said, I'd be interested in speaking to your new boyfriend. Um, and before I knew it, within... I'd say six months, I'd created the official player rating system of the Barclays Premier League. Um, I'd forgotten extreme value statistics existed. And from that moment on, I was involved in sports analytics. It wasn't by design, it was pure luck. Um, it's worth noting that nowadays, sports analytics or sports statistics is a very viable career path for people. Sports teams and organisations no statistics is extremely valuable to them. You only need to think about the Moneyball story, um, which is where a Major League Baseball team performed well above expectations relative to their spend using statistics to help them recruit players. So now as a sports analytics person, I've got two feathers to my bow, I'd say. I'd say um, first thing I started doing was forecasting the results of sports events so think about forecasting the results of a football match how would you go about it um, the second um, area of expertise i've got is how to rate and rank players in individual sports or in team sports so in individual sports it's a bit easier for example to try and work out who the best tennis player is but in team sports it's not simple at all to work out who the best footballer is because there's very complex dynamics as players interact with teammates and with opposition players. So I'll give you an, two examples of, of where I use statistics in my job now. Um, it's quite interesting to think about your own career, to give a talk like this. And I realise, I think I've built my entire career out of the Poisson distribution. So I... I really like the Poisson distribution. It describes the distribution of goals in a football match. And you can create a bivariate Poisson distribution, which simultaneously describes the distribution of home goals and away goals. You can add dependency between these two distributions to come up with more complicated distributions. But fundamentally, 
my entire career has been built off knowing and using the Poisson distribution. Um, and there are two examples I'm going to talk about. The first is detecting match fixing in football, which is something that I've done with FIFA and UEFA. Uh, and the second application is estimating the impact of player changes in football teams. I'm not going to go into technical details, so I'll just describe what these things end up looking like. So this is a bit of consultancy work that I did for Manchester United a few years ago. So this was done in April 2021. Um, at this moment in time, Manchester United are second in the Premier League and they think they've solved their post-Alex Ferguson worries. Um, for those who don't know, Manchester United were historically a very, very good team. Then their manager, Alex Ferguson, retired and they have since suffered um, poor performance, really, relative to their spend. So something's going wrong at Manchester United. Um, but in this particular season, they were second in the league and they thought they were well on the way to recovery and becoming a, a, a power of English football again. Um, they got in touch with me and said, what will happen if we buy Harry Kane in the summer? Um, we're second in the league at the moment. Will he help us win the league? Um, and then I used my expertise in forecasting. So I've got a forecasting model for football, which is based on the players on the pitch. So if the players are good on the pitch on your team and the players on the opposition team are less good, your probability of winning is probably higher. And then if you add even better players to your team, like Harry Kane, you'd expect your probability of winning to go up even more. So that's on a match by match basis. You can work this out. So what I do is I simulate the entire season. So all 38 matches for all 20 teams, I simulate the results of them based on the players on the pitch. And there's you need to use algorithms to simulate which players are actually selected by managers and which players are available because of injuries and so on. But these are minor details. So the punchline is that you can simulate a league season for a given set of players in a given league. On the left here of this diagram, we've got the predictions for the 2021-22 season for Manchester United. Um, if they kept the team, the squad, the players that they had at that moment when they were second in the league, and we and the simulations came back and said the probability of winning the league is half a percent. Your probability of finishing the top four is 26 percent. Bearing in mind they're second in the league at this moment. They didn't think this was very impressive. It, it didn't align with what their expectations were. We said on average, if you don't do anything to your squad, you're going to finish 5.9th in the league, about sixth. If, however, you buy Harry Kane, I pick him up, put him in, the, in their squad, and I simulate the league another 100,000 times, I think it was. We'd simulated the league with Harry Kane and without Harry Kane. Um, the probability of winning the league goes up to three and a half percent from half a percent. So your team improves. But unlike the question that you posed of me at the start, are we likely to win the league? No, you're still not likely to win the league. At the time, Manchester United were much worse than Liverpool, Manchester City and even Chelsea. Um, they weren't going to compete for the league, even if they bought Harry Kane. Their probability of finishing in the top four um, goes from 26% to 62%, which is a big increase. And the nice thing about these simulations, because they're player-based, you've picked Harry Kane up and taken him from his current team and put him in the new team, Manchester United. The, the team that used to have him has been weakened, which was Tottenham Hotspur. And they were a major rival for Manchester United to fight for the top four places. So Tottenham Hotspur's probability of top four would plummet whereas Manchester United's probability of top four is rocketed. With Harry Kane, we expected their league position to be about fourth, which has gone up from sixth, which is a huge increase, really. Two league places for one player is a, is a big increase. Um, but interestingly, this didn't align whatsoever with Manchester United's preconceptions of where they were. Where do you think they finished in the season? They actually did finish sixth in the end. They they bought Ronaldo and it all went a bit a bit wrong. But this shows you how you can use 
quite advanced statistical models underlying this presentation to address real world problems that are of interest to to to, to me as well, let alone the, the people who are paying for the paying for the work. The second um, example of statistics that I use in my day to day life is that of detecting match fixing. So this is going to be quite hard to explain in the time I've got. So I might do a bad job of this, but I'll try anyway. The we can build in play models. So as a football match progresses, you can build a model that says the probability of team one winning is 40 percent. Then as time ticks along, the probability will change. So what you see here is minute naught to minute, can't see it, 90. Um, and effectively, these are the odds or probabilities on a different scale, one over the probabilities of a team winning or an event happening. The event in this case is the total number of goals. So early on in the match, there's a betting market called the, the total over 2.25 goals. Don't worry about what the 2.25 means. It means you can bet on whether there'll be more than two goals in the game. And the probabilities from the market odds, which are the non-yellow, dark yellow dots, are aligned very nicely with the model odds. I'm explaining this really badly. Let me start again. Model odds are shown in yellow. So they're underneath these market odds. In an efficient market, the model odds and the market odds should be about the same. And you can see that in this match, which is not a fixed match, the two align very closely. As the market moves, a model, which based on the Poisson distribution, um, move together. So this is a not suspicious match. There's nothing odd going on in the betting market. Whereas this match, there is something odd going on in the betting market. And you can see towards the end of the match, the market odds shown as, I'll go to this purple bit here, between 55th minute and 70th minute, are diverging away from what the model is saying. So this market is for there to be more than five goals. At the moment, there's been one, two, three, four goals. That's what these gray vertical lines are. And as time runs out, you'd expect the probability of there being more than five goals, given that there's only been four goals, to be decreasing, i.e. the odds will be will be lengthening. So the, the model is behaving intuitively. However, the market is saying that the probability, or the well, the odds are shortening, so the probability is increasing that there'll be more than five goals, even though time is running out for those goals to happen. Um, what's happening is, People who fix the match are putting a lot of money on the market for over five goals. And to protect themselves, bookmakers move the odds. Um, and this is a suspicious match. And in the end, it was proven to be fixed. Um, so UEFA and then FIFA, and they go and try and find out who these criminals are and who the players or referee responsible for setting this fixing process were. Now, I'll flick on from that. Um, I thought I'd offer some lessons and thoughts from my career that might help people. Lesson one, I moved on from things I didn't like doing pretty quickly. I did make a few mistakes in my career. I didn't like being an investment analyst, but you can make really good money at it, but it wasn't for me. Um, it's already been mentioned, do not underestimate the value of being able to communicate um, although I failed miserably to do it on the last slide, um, and being able to present your results visually. It's a, it's an extremely useful thing to be able to do. Um, if you want to do research, for example, in academia, I'd say imagination is at least as important as technical skill. If you've not got imagination, i.e. you can't come up with lots and lots of ideas for research papers or research projects, you might run out of ideas. And you don't want to do that as an academic because you're under pressure to come up with new research projects all the time. Um, if you want to be paid more or rise the ranks in your organisation, be prepared to become more than just a technical statistician. Um, you will need to manage projects at some point. Um, 
I really do enjoy learning. Um, statistics is not a field that is staying the same. There's forever new methodologies being born and being brought out. Machine learning, artificial intelligence. I feel like as a statistician, we've been stung a little bit because we've now got to learn the, an entire new field of machine learning, which didn't exist, certainly when I, well, it existed, but it wasn't taught when I was at university. Um, inevitably, as your career progresses, you will go from being somebody who does all the coding, does all the analysis, to somebody who talks about the analysis and tells people what to do. But it's still really important to understand what you're doing. Um, in the early part of my career, I said yes to almost everything, certainly to meetings to discuss possible projects and opportunities. Um, you never know what's going to come out of a, of, a, of a meeting that might seem like it's not worth going to. Um, so yeah, so there, there's some tips. I won't bother going through that, I've not got time. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, so could we have all of our speakers turn their cameras back on now and then we can start the panel discussion? Yeah, uh, if I can invite the speakers to come back in. I think we have everybody, we have John as well. Hopefully we still have John with us. Um, so as we as we said before, you can you can put uh, some questions in the chat there. Um, just to give you a bit of time to do that, if you had any questions to formulate, I, I might go along the speakers and, and just ask um, what, what sounds like a relatively simple question, but if, I suppose it might might generate a bit of debate. Do you see what you do as more statistics or as data science? And which do you think is, is kind of more important for your sector? So let, let's go backwards uh, along our speaker list. So if we can start with Ian on that, please. Nowadays, I think what I do is more data science. Um, earlier on in my career, it was more statistics. and I would derive distributions and, and be a bit more theoretical. Um, now I think I've specialised, or maybe my colleagues have specialised more, and there are people who are better at the hardcore statistics than I am. So we marry up our skills and strong points to be able to produce results more quickly. Uh, can I ask Mehdi next, please? Yep, sure thing. Yeah, I, I would probably say I do more data science nowadays. Um, um, but I think uh, that's my personal kind of career journey. But I think in the civil service as a whole, um, there's an increased focus on data science. But when it comes to statistics, uh, like I mentioned, there's so many people involved in stats that actually, um, and it's such a blurry, blurry line between statisticians, operational researchers, social researchers these days. It's more of a kind of family of analysts, and those there's those technical analysts which deal with the numbers, and then the non-technical analysts which deal with kind of stories and proposals after finding out what the numbers are saying. Uh, I'll go to Lucy next, please. Sure. Uh, I think I would say I do statistics more. Um, I think of data science as being kind of like a, a culmination of people that are amazing at computer engineering and also data, uh, you know, and statistics. So they've almost got like three hats on at once, um, whereas I focus more on like still methods and things like that. So um, I think a lot of people in applied research are data scientists uh, and I love working with them because they've got so many skills, but myself, I'm firmly on the statistics side. Mm -hmm. uh, and how about you, John? Yeah, I think we'd probably say that our team is probably more data science, but obviously statistics is just a, an element of data science, so it's, it's, it's one of the key cornerstones, but uh, it sits within a, a data science framework, really. Uh, and finally, I'll go to Catherine. As a very big non-specialist, I'd say data science, but um, probably a little bit of both. Cool. I, I I thought that that the, there was some interesting diversity in the answers there, which is kind of what I was what I was hoping for. Um, 
So I can see we've got a, a few questions in the chat. There's there's one here to start with, um, which is specifically for Mehdi, but I might kind of open it up afterwards to talk a little bit about how um, I suppose how, how postgraduate degrees affect the trajectory of careers in your area. So Anna has asked if if a master's degree is needed for the vast stream, or if if you can just enter it with a with a bachelor's degree, Mehdi. Yep, you can come in just with a bachelor's, so no master's needed. Um, in general, in the civil service, just to, just to highlight the benefit of a master's is uh, quite a lot of departments have a uh, an extra pay uplift if you have more experience. Uh, so if you come in with a if you come in as a an analyst in the general civil service with a master's or a PhD, then you'll get this pay uplift. Uh, but yeah, for the fast stream specifically, bachelor's is more than good enough. Okay, fantastic. And uh, is there any any of our other speakers got any kind of views on the difference that a, a master's or, or other kind of postgraduate degree might make? I think in our field. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, go on, John. We'll go John first, then Lucy. Yeah, I think in our field, a, a master's in a relevant discipline is always well. We'll, we'll give you that extra edge. Um, so, because it is a quite a specialist area, ultimately. So, uh, yeah, masters is is you would usually uh, give you a greater chance of success in terms of recruitment, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not essential. I think I would have said something similar. Um, so, the edge that I can see from masters or a PhD is like that the the person that you're employing is is has done something independently. They've they've written maybe a thesis or decided on the project themselves and and executed that so they've got maybe a bit more experience of working independently and, and that always helps I think um, but we do have graduate programs at, at, at BT that help to bring everybody up to that same level so um, mm -hmm. I don't see it as a um, kind of you know no if you've not got a master's. Yeah that, that's great to hear though because I, I, I am aware that there's you know there are some industries that don't really understand or recognise the value of masters and PhDs. So, um, I mean, it's good to hear that's not the case for some of these options for statisticians. Uh, I'm going to go next to a question from uh, Nathan. So, uh, is there any of our speakers that are able to share an insight into how data science can or should be used in software testing disciplines? I don't know who might be most similar to software testing here. Possibly you, Lucy? Yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure what he means by software testing, so possibly not, um, unfortunately. OK, um, it might not be so much question for our speakers here, but um, I'm just thinking there are a few. So so within the Royal Statistical Society, obviously we're hosting this through the young statistician section. There are other specialist sections for different areas, including computational statistics um, and also data science and AI. So it could be worth approaching them with this question uh, if you're thinking about careers in those sort of adjacent areas. Generally, the sections are as, as friendly as we are and, uh, and are happy to offer advice on that sort of thing. So you can find more about those on the, on the RSS website. Um, I'm going to go next to a question from uh, Ellis. So this, this is just an open one for any of our speakers. Uh, what do you think are the challenges for starting a career as a statistician? I'll say one challenge I've I've experienced in my time. Maybe it's specific to academia, but I'd, I'd imagine it's just, it's actually worse in organisations. People think you know every area of statistics and can solve every statistical problem. So so many people come to me and say, "Ah, statistician, I've got this data set and I'm interested in doing X, Y, and Z." And I think, "Oh no, I don't know how to do that." <laughs> I can see a question there about um, how important do you find on the job learning. Well, I'm, I'm 25 years into it now and I'm still learning on the job almost every day. Mm -hmm. I end up typing into Google, what is Kruskal Wallace test or, or, or something, <laughs> reminding myself of something I've forgotten. So it's ongoing. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I think every day is a school day and uh, I think it's, so the older you get, you seem to need to learn even more rather than less. So uh, I think I'm doing more learning now than I did 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
we're just on that um, oh, challenges oh, for starting a career. So I, I'm probably the guilty party here but when we do get people with statistical knowledge coming into our organisation and saying, well, you know about statistics, you must know what, what tests we should apply to this data set. Um, so, yeah, so I'm probably the, the guilty person that, that Ian has to uh, deal with. I'd say another challenge is uh, job titles at the moment. Um, I saw when I was applying for my job at BT, I saw lots of different job like adverts out there and I actually didn't really know what I was applicable to uh, like I was looking at the descriptions of the jobs and they had lots of buzzwords in them that weren't necessarily there when I was doing my undergraduate degree and my PhD and I felt like oh I'm, I can't do any of these jobs even though I'm trained in statistics and um, it, it took a lot for me to apply for a few jobs and then when I got in there they were like yeah you're exactly what we want and I was surprised so I think sometimes it's just not knowing what exactly they want by saying like data scientist or AI engineer or things like that, that you could actually be the person for the job. So just kind of apply it. it you know, there's no problem, not a problem with actually applying for something because you might be the person with the experience that they want. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's a very good point. Sorry, go ahead, Maddie. Sorry, I was just going to say, building on that, I think it's um, kind of selling yourself short and forgetting that in most of the time when you're applying for a job, you don't need to know every, unless they explicitly ask you to be an expert in every single thing they've listed, you don't need to be an expert. And so I, I remember being given a piece of advice, which is if you're applying for a job and you can do about three quarters of it, and about one quarter you have no idea then you're qualified uh, because with every role ideally with every job you learn more you develop as both your technical capability but also your general kind of skill set as a as, well, as a person um, and so if you look at a job description then you can see tick 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 i can do three quarter of these things one quarter i know roughly what it means but i've never done it i can't do it don't be afraid to apply because there's a very good chance that you're good enough and when you get there you'll pick it up and you'll do a great job Thanks for that. Um, I might ask Catherine as well, because I guess you, you you might have faced some particular challenges coming from a, a kind of undergraduate background that wasn't really quantitative. Yeah, so I think my GCSE in statistics is the only technical qualification I have in statistics. So, yeah, coming from history is very different and um, yeah, and then my undergrad, um, sorry, my MSc then turned into a bigger piece of um, which was meant to be lab based and say so it went into being a data set from three, actually three different data sets. Um, and essentially, yeah, I would agree with people saying about on the job or on even on the qualification learning, if that makes sense. I did like try to, well, I learned to code a little bit through um, doing my dissertation and that kind of thing, which is something I want to pick up more again now. Mm -hmm. But I say as a non specialist, it it's quite daunting that that's probably now more of my work alongside but also that communication I think as many of the other speakers said so yeah the importance of like I think of doing my master's also was learning to learn again and the research and and how you apply things um and what they mean from those you know being rigorous with the data that you're being given and I think that's like I identified the challenges that we're getting now about around data collection and the use of it here at, at work and being truthful and honest with what we can say from that data if we're not sure about the data quality, I think is um, one of my biggest challenges. Yeah, so mm -hmm. those all those learnings across so the soft skills, but also the, the, the more, um, the actual statistics stuff as well. It's like, coming again oh, yeah. another round of it's coming my way so yep. yeah 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 that make that makes total sense and I get as statisticians really our, our technical skills could be applied to any kind of data we've got a, a huge diversity of of different types of data represented across our, our talks earlier on so it, it's it's kind of there will always be nuances with that data that you'll have to learn as a statistician too um, I guess I'm, I'm going to just kind of um, move into uh, an adjacent question that we had about on the job learning. Some some of us have kind of alluded to it before, but um, if there's no, anybody who hasn't really mentioned how much on the job learning they're able to do and how important it is, uh, could I ask, yeah, what, what are your opinions on 
on the job learning or what's your experience been? I think um, I'd agree with what's been said before and um, learning every day, um, new projects and new uh, kind of methods are coming out all the time. So um, it seems like you are learning all the time and BT have got really good connections with universities. So there's like routes to learn about uh, new methods through that. And I always find it is one of the best parts of my role to work with like um, students and uh, learn from them basically what is the best new thing to do or um can I think about this differently um you tell me that kind of approach mm -hmm. John go ahead yeah I think it's not and it's not just about on the job specifically it's also obviously things like you know the professional societies and all the seminars webinars conferences that they run it's a very good way of getting up to up to date learning new new techniques or, or new principles or whatever it may be um, so definitely joining a relevant society or or uh, institution that uh, helps with professional development, then uh, that's uh, often the one of the best ways to to keep in keep up to date and learn yeah. new stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's worth saying, you know, it, the RSS it could well be one of those organisations. If if this is your first time engaging with us in one of our events, I would definitely recommend you you look up more about the RSS, particularly because you can get free uh, membership if you are a student. Um, so thanks for allowing me to just <laughs> segue into that in there. Um, Shameless plug there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we got another question here about um, the, what kind of skills are missing from your line of work, which you wish more newcomers had. I suppose that that's in in the colleagues, in the people that you're working with, in the, in terms of statistics. I think a conference in verbal communications. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who rely on email and text and they always say pick up the phone and speak to these people. OK, and OK. People, and people feel very reluctant to do that. There's, I think there's a, a nervousness about speaking to someone face to face or over the phone. Uh, so if you get the opportunity to have to give presentations, to do verbal communications, not just written and email and text and social media communications, I think that's a, it's still a valuable uh, skill despite our modern technological uh, communications. Liam, I've got to go. I've got another meeting at half past two. Sure, sure. Thank, Thank you for joining, Ian. Bye bye. No worries. Take care now. Um, yeah, so we were talking about um, skills that uh, newcomers might might seem to be missing in, in your sectors. I don't know if Mehdi, Lucy, Catherine, you have any perspectives on that? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I think um, speaking about the civil service specifically and, and the fast stream, I think a lot of people come in with a lot of technical knowledge, which is great. But then and, and, and actually um, being responsible for I, I'm, I'm responsible for quite a bit of recruitment these days. Um, it's it's those soft skills which people it kind of lets people down to a certain degree. So being able to communicate and remembering um, not only about how to communicate things clearly, um, and, and in particular to a non-technical audience. So in the case of government, that might be a minister or a policy person, but also mm -hmm. how to work with non-technical people. I think some people are so used to talking in a mathematical language or in a technical language with other people. And so if you're working on a project, and I, and, and I assume it's the same for the private sector or any other organisation, it's not just going to be all analysts together, sitting together, coming up with a plan, and then they send it off. Some Quite often there are people who implement those decisions implement the actual operational delivery of things you're all sitting together and so you have to come up with a language which works for everyone so you can get the nuance of your analysis across but without those people who actually go out and well in the case of government serving the public not sitting there dumbstruck trying to figure out okay exactly okay what exactly are we meant to do next yeah so i saw a lot of nod in there i think i think we all agree on that um, yeah, I, I'm aware. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. No, just like disagreeing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's a very good point. That I'm aware we're, we're just over time, so I might wrap up with uh, with a one last question uh, rather quickly. So, uh, do you think students from distance learning universities, so um, things like online courses, open university, have a disadvantage compared to brick uni students in getting jobs and statistics? I suppose we touched a little bit on on communication there, but do you think there's any other kind of differences with uh, online learning graduates 
versus in-person learning graduates in, in your experiences? On behalf of the civil service, nope. <laughs> as long as you've got the skills, we're happy to have you. <laughs> yeah, same for BT. I'd say that if you um, have a, a good CV, wherever your degree's from, then we're going to interview you and we're going to take the person that communicates, you know, mm -hmm. what they've done, their interests and why they want the job on the day uh, best. So um, I wouldn't say so, no. Okay. I, think, I tend to agree. I think the more important thing is regardless of which university type you're at, the brick or, or distance learning, getting out and getting some experience and through either volunteering or from some sort of work experience is, 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 is probably the bigger issue. Uh, mm -hmm. It di differentiates mm -hmm. candidates from each other rather than which university they went to, whether it was a brick university or a or, uh, distance learning. Sure. Uh, and any any last thoughts on that, Catherine? Not really. I mean, because we come through more of a conservation route, I, mm -hmm. there's very few conservation courses in the first place, let alone distance learning. Um, but I imagine for preventive, it wouldn't necessarily, if like John said about actual volunteering or what other work experience would be valid there. And for conservation scientists, which are more, you know, probably our heavier usage of stats and that kind of thing. Um, I, I imagine I'm not, I couldn't really speak to that. I think it'd be up to the, yeah, the same kind of thing, work experience as well. Yeah. Great. OK, uh, we're coming up to 20 to 3 now, so I think we should uh, just close the event. But I hope you'll all join me in thanking our five speakers, Catherine List, John Sanders, Lucy Gullen, Mehdi Walji and Ian McHale once again for their fantastic insights. Uh, and we've been the Young Statistician section chaired by Srishti um, and I'm representing the Merseyside local group uh, along with Gareth here. So thank you again for joining our event and we'll hope to see you soon, whether it's in person or online again.